Good evening, everyone. Well, this will be my last chance to speak to you for uh, at least the next three weeks. Uh, Lord willing, I'll be back on Wednesday night, the 30th. And I'm looking forward to my time with uh, my brothers and sisters in Guyana. I appreciate so much uh, your concern and support for the prayers that have been offered and continue to be offered. I, I thank you all very, very much. I wanted to make um, an announcement that this morning it just did not materialize, nor was it necessarily appropriate in the time, but uh, John Daca has posted in the back the latest plans for the building. These will still change somewhat. Um, those obviously are not building plans, but they're there for us to look at. Uh, take time to look at those, if you would. And uh, if you have any questions, there's going to be uh, a congregational meeting uh, coming up in the future. The date has not been set, but be looking at the plans. And if you have questions about those or comments or concerns or what have you, uh, please make note of those so those can be addressed because you may think to write the question down and someone else may have the question but not write it down and so we want to make sure that everybody has their um, their input or their questions answered these plans have been formed over the course of the last 18 months uh, based upon architectural engineering and city in order to address what we believe uh, is needful for us to continue to grow and so we had certain requirements of classrooms and multi-purpose space and worship space etc and what we have back there obviously doesn't look anything like what we began with but we began with a single level structure and we've had to reduce it for a number of reasons uh, the city has kind of uh, hemmed us into a corner on some things and so we had to to do some but it's two-story, but it is a daylight basement. So every level can be accessed from ground level. Now, the city does require that since it is a second level, there will have to be an elevator in there for uh, accessibility. And so that, that's not gonna be a problem. But we have, as you look at the plan, the worship space and the multi-purpose space are all on the same level. And then the classrooms are in the daylight basement. Uh, the classrooms are primarily for the younger folks, but there will be a couple of adult classrooms there. So if there is an adult or if there's a child that has a soccer injury or something and they can't navigate stairs, we have the elevator to bring people uh, up and down uh, for that. Our larger committee uh, that includes uh, Denny Collins and Jim Johnson and um, Marisa Pfeiffer, as well as uh, uh, J.P. Charpentier, John Daca, and myself. Uh, once this gets finalized with the city, we're going to be looking at the details of the building. And that, that's when things are going to get fun. Because we've been stuck in quicksand for about a year. And so everybody's had ideas, and everybody's concerned, and hey, are there any updates? Yeah, the latest update is there is no update, because the city has been dragging their feet and dragging their feet. They give us a list of things they want us to address on the preliminary plans. First one was 34 pages. When we answered the 34 pages, they sent it back with 16 more pages of questions that were not on the first 34. And it cost us another 90 days. So we lost 180 days through that process. Um, however, through that process, we believe we got a much more efficient structure that will still meet all of our needs, plenty of parking, the things that the city needs in order to satisfy neighbors, codes, all of those kinds of things. And so please uh, take time over the next few weeks uh, if there's anything you don't like, I'm going to be gone for three weeks. Be sure and get it out before I get back. 
And uh, if there's anything that you do like, uh, my email address. Uh, but I, I will tell you that um, there's been minimal input from JP and myself. John Dack has done the lion's share of this. And he's done yeoman's duty on this. And he deserves some very strong appreciation from the congregation because he has put in a lot of personal time and effort in communicating with engineers and the city and the architect and, and keeping the elders in the loop and keeping others in the loop. And he's done a, a magnificent job. He could not have done a better job. Uh, so please be sure and, and direct your, your praise to him because he is certainly worthy of it. Let's pray together as we begin our lesson for tonight. Thank you, Father, so much. What a blessing today has been. To come into your presence and to worship as your family. To remember the sacrifice of your son. To hear from hearts that are broken by their condition and their seeking guidance, forgiveness, and encouragement. Father, we thank you. And we ask you to be with us tonight as we look into another portion of your word. We're so blessed to, to have your word, to have it in a language we can understand, written in a way that we can not only understand, but apply it in our lives. Thank you for loving us enough for making that possible. And as we study from it, Father, we ask for your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul writes, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. The Bible pulls no punches in telling us that people who are in sin are dead. And the, the reference to being dead there is spiritual death. Separation from God is spiritual death. Jesus told our great-great-grandparents way back in the very beginning, you can eat of every tree but that one over there. And, and if you eat of it, in that day you will surely die. And Satan come and came and told the lie to Adam and Eve, and Eve's the one primarily he's speaking with there, told them, did he really say that you would die in that day? And you know, they didn't die physically that day. But they began to die physically that day, but they died spiritually that day because they separated themselves from God. And so people who are in sin are dead, spiritually speaking. And it's important to recognize that. And as you look at these first three verses, uh, he says, we were made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Begins talking about how we once conducted ourselves. As we study Luke 15, especially in reference to the prodigal son. We understand that in the world of sin, life is wasted. It's a wasted life. Because it is a life lived for self. It is not a life lived for God. A life lived for God is a life that is everlasting. A life lived for self is so temporary. And it is without any true satisfaction. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. The Apostle Paul writing to Titus says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly when? In this present age. When Paul wrote, when was that? It was the first century. When is the present age now as the Holy Spirit has preserved this writing down to our time for our edification? The 
present ages now. And so we need to honor that. And I want to make a point here before we get into the main point of our lesson is those who don't live for him won't live with him in eternity. Those who do not live for him will not live with him in eternity. And that is, that's an important concept to wrap our heads around. We've got, you know, a lot of people are, are parachute Christians. They think they'll live their life, you know, on that airplane that's going down to the very last second, and then they'll jump off and they'll pull the Jesus ripcord and they'll be saved. And, you know, I, I don't deny deathbed conversions if they are obedient and follow what God has laid out for them. Uh, I believe the grace of God is big enough to, to carry that. But I think a person that becomes caught up in their own pleasure and their own lifestyle don't have an understanding of who Jesus is and that ripcord will not be there for them as the plane is going down. We have to live for him or we won't live with him. So the primary text we want to look at tonight is Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is not I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so tonight I want to talk to you for just a moment about the life I now live. Because we saw in Ephesians chapter 2 what we once were. And we see what we are supposed to be now in this present age. And for those of us who've been crucified with Christ, that is, buried with him through baptism into death and raised to walk in a new life, having crucified the old man, we now live a life differently than we did before and differently from the world. The life, life I now live. First of all, it is a cross-centered life. The cross was the central message of Paul's preaching. He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 uh, through 25, as well as chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, that he did not cease to declare the gospel, the death of the burial, the resurrection of Christ. To a person who is perishing, the cross is foolishness. I didn't have enough time this morning to say everything I wanted to say in reference to what happened in that courtroom, but let me tell you something. Those people that are criticizing that young man, to them that message is foolishness. That message of forgiveness and grace that he offered that's foolishness. That's exactly what Paul's dealing with in the first century. It's what we're dealing with now. The second thing I didn't have time to talk about is the reason we need to be that young man that's sitting there in that witness stand is because that was us sitting as a defendant. We were the one who was guilty. We were the one who was condemned. And Jesus was the one who extended forgiveness to us. And so the reason we need to take that young man's place and extend that to others, no matter who they may be, is because of what Jesus did for us. The message central to Paul was the cross. All of history from the very moment that the foundation of the earth was laid, even before sin entered the world, in the mind of God, the Lamb of God, His Son, was already on that cross. And everything throughout history is moving us toward and pointing us to the cross. Since that seminal event in human history, everything extends outward from that event and is impacted positively or negatively by that event. And you say, negatively, how could it be negative? Because those who believe that the message of the cross is foolish, 
they allow their hearts to become hard and they turn aside and don't listen. They stop up their ears. They cover their eyes. They harden their heart and they don't listen to that message. As we mentioned this morning, the message of Christ is a stumbling block to those who are disobedient. But everyone is impacted by this beautiful message. It is a cross, uh, excuse me, a, uh, a cross-centric message. Forgiveness of sins is only available through the blood that was shed on that cross. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You cannot be forgiven apart from the blood of Christ. I mean, I can forgive you and you can forgive me, but you cannot be forgiven eternally by our Heavenly Father without the benefit of the blood of Jesus. It's not there. You know, we we sing a song, and, and I'm going to get to Guyana, and we're probably going to sing it every time we get together wherever I am, no matter wh- what congregation I'm at or in chapel service. We're probably going to sing it several times. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. They love that song down there. They sing it a lot, and I can't wait to sing it with them. Beautiful song. Simple message, but extremely profound. You cannot receive it. It's only available through the blood of Jesus. You see, Christians have been crucified with Christ. I've been crucified with Christ, Paul says, Galatians 2.20. We all have been crucified with Christ through our baptism. Romans chapter 6, the apostle gives us some insight into this. Beginning in verse 3, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. The life that I now live is a cross-centered life. We glory in that cross. The Apostle Paul later in the Galatian letter in chapter 6 and verse 14 says, I will only boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. That is my only boast. Because as Isaiah prophesied 700 years before Christ, the truth of the statement still applies today that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags before God. But through the blood of Christ, we can be made whole. Through the cross of Christ. Secondly, the life that I now live is a life of consecration. It is a cross-centered life, but it is also a life of consecration. The flesh often identifies a life that is alienated from God. In the Galatian letter, also in chapter 5, certainly this is not unfamiliar to most of us. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the works of the flesh, that you, when flesh is there, it usually identifies a life that is alienated from God. But as we see the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, we still, even though we live in this flesh, we are not of the flesh any longer. We're of the cross. We're of Christ. And therefore, we have a new master in our lives. It's not our sins. 
It's not our desires. It's not our passions. It's Jesus Christ. Again, there is no way that young man that I showed you this morning does what he does if Christ wasn't, wasn't in charge of his life. It just doesn't happen. He had turned it over to Christ. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, even though we're in the flesh, we've offered ourselves as a daily sacrifice, a living sacrifice, so that we're no longer giving in to the desires of the flesh, even though we are still bound by this flesh. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And thirdly, the life that I now live is a life of confidence. A life of confidence. The Christian life is a life that is lived by faith. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That word substance refers to a foundation or that which holds something else up. And faith is the substance of our hopes. It is the foundation for our hopes. It is what holds our hopes up. Because we believe in something that we cannot see and hope for something that we have never seen. And if our faith doesn't work, then our hope is not going to be where it needs to be. But we have confidence that even though we live by faith, that that hope will be realized through Jesus Christ. Through what he has done for us. How he has provided for us. In the Christian life, we are living confident of accomplishing the things that are worthwhile to achieve in this life based upon what Christ has directed us to. As you see the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4 talking about, you know, I've been hungry and I've been filled. You know, I've, I've been naked, I've been clothed. I've been destitute, I've had everything. I mean, he goes through all of these things and he says, I have learned to be content regardless of my circumstances. That's the whole point of what he's talking about. And when he gets to verse 13, I can do, I can endure all things through Christ who gives me strength. The confidence that we have is because of Christ, not because of us. If your confidence is in yourself, and your abilities, and your holiness, and your righteousness, it is not only misplaced, but it is futile. Our confidence must be in Christ. For without Him, we are nothing. I can do, I can endure all these things through Christ. He didn't say, I wish I could. I might be able to. Certainly on a good day, I possibly could. He says, I can. I can. I don't know how many Star Wars fans there are here. I've only seen the first three that came out when I was in high school and college, so I'm way behind. Because there's been, I guess, another nine or ten since then. But there was a little bitty guy, a little weird dude called Yoda. All right? And he was training young Luke Skywalker. And he says, he tells him what to do, and he says, I'll try. And he says, try not, do. 
try not do. Jesus says you can, don't try, you can do all things through me who gives you strength. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 16, down through the first verse of chapter 5. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are, etern- are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is going to go away. This is temporary. What we get at our resurrection, whatever that looks like, whatever it consists of, our resurrected bodies that will not be corruptible anymore, but will be incorruptible, will not be mortal, but will take on immortality, whatever that is, God's got it figured out. But you don't have to live very long in this life to know that this is going away. in a pretty short amount of time. But Paul says, we don't lose heart over these things. We're confident because we know what's on the other side. We know what awaits us. The life I now live is a life that is cross-centered. The life that I now live is a life of consecration. The life that I now live is a life of confidence. Not because of me, but because of him. I've been crucified with Christ. The old man's gone. see when we crucify ourselves, we place the cross at the center of our lives it's not something that we store away for weekends and special holidays it's a life Jesus says take up your cross daily and follow me The daily existence. The life I now live is placing the cross at the center of my life. The life that I now live is dedicating myself to a holy and consecrated life. The life that I now live is remaining confidently assured in the one who raised my Savior Jesus from the dead. You see, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What a powerful, powerful verse with so many implications into our life. This existence that we have for such a brief amount of time. To live by faith in the Son of God 
who loved me. We have a Savior that before we were a twinkle in our parents' eye, He loved us and knew that we would need a Savior. And He loved us and went to that cross for us. Before the DNA came together across these last 2,000 years to make us who we are, He knew us and He loved us anyway. That's hard to fathom a lot of times, especially if you know yourself and you are honest with yourself. There are times in your life when you can't imagine that God would love you, that Christ would love you and die for you. But he did, and the enormity of his love can never be overstated. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Where are you tonight in your walk of faith? Are you living a a cross-centered life, a consecrated life, and a confident life? If you're struggling with any of those things, can we pray with you? Can we pray for you? Can we encourage you tonight? Or if you're here and you've never named the name of Christ, put him on in baptism, you've never crucified the old man and been crucified with Christ. Will you allow us to talk with you about that tonight? Whatever your need is, please make it known to us as together we stand and sing.